so thank you for the intro introduction. Uh, they kind of summarize what we're gonna do. So we're gonna talk to you based on personal experience about making our own ORM, what was good, what was bad, how we did it, and when we would recommend doing it again. So I'm Mari. Uh, I just recently moved to New York, and this is my first time at a JavaScript meetup, and it's been such a good experience. So thank you to the organizers and all the other presenters. I was really inspired by everyone's slides, and I'm going to like Google when I get home how to make my slides prettier. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, it's been really great. Yep, and I'm Sam. Uh, I also work at Nava. Uh, this is also my first JavaScript meetup of any kind, and yeah, it's been really great. Uh, I've set a really high bar, so um, good work, everybody. <laughs> um, cool, so a little bit about what we're going to talk about today. Um, we're going to start with the intro to Nava, the company that we work at, um, and our work on Medicare. Uh, and then we'll talk about what uh, NoRound is and how you can build your own. Uh, we'll discuss the good, the bad, uh, and evaluate uh, an essential question. I think anytime you build something yourself, would you do it again? Uh, cool. So we work at Nava. It's headquartered in uh, Washington, D.C., and this is our mission right here. So we believe that government services can and should be simple, effective, and accessible to all. So we've probably all had experiences where this isn't quite the case. Maybe you've been to the DMV and like waited in a line to wait in another line to wait in another line, and that's the type of experience that we want to fix. Uh, so this is what we work on uh, now. That we've enrolled 23 million people on healthcare.gov. Uh, we've processed 440,000 veterans' benefits appeals. Uh, we've architected the largest change in Medicare since its founding, uh, and we've streamlined how states administer benefits. Uh, and today we're going to talk about our work on Medicare. So, a little primer on what Medicare is. So, as many of you maybe are aware, the United States does not have socialized health care, but there is Medicare, and this provides health insurance for the elderly. And it serves about 15% of the American population, which adds up to around 44 million beneficiaries. Uh, so, both Mari and I work on the Quality Payment Program at Medicare, or QPP. Uh, QPP is an ambitious effort within the program to change how healthcare payments are incentivized. Uh, so traditionally, Medicare is operated under a fee-for-service model. So essentially, the more care that a doctor provides, the more they get paid. Uh, and that produces the wrong incentives. Um, mm -hmm. So the goal of QPP is to implement a quality-based system, where instead doctors are compensated on the quality of care they provide and the patient outcomes. Uh, so the government believes that this is a better payment model, not just because it produces better outcomes for patients, uh, but it's also better for the long-term financial sustainability of the program. Uh, it's also important to point out the scale of the problem that we're working on. Uh, so Medicare processes $178 billion every year in payments, that's billion with a B, um, to doctors who are serving 44 million uh, elderly and often uh, vulnerable patients. Uh, so that's a lot of money flying around, uh, and it's really important to get the incentives working correctly. Uh, so at NAVA, our work for the last two years has been to build a technical system that supports this change in financial incentives uh, under QPP. So it's awesome. We're working on something that has a really large impact, but there are also problems that arise working in the context of the U.S. government. Uh, this right here is a very small snippet of a 800 plus page document that's produced every year that's actually like an addendum to the original legislation for the quality payment program. And it's really long and really hard to understand. It's kind of in like this policy legalese. And this is what we have to use as an implementation guide. So we need to translate this document into product requirements, into something that engineers can actually go and build. And that is not an easy task. And oftentimes, something like this is really subject to interpretation. Uh, so I know you're all thinking, uh, <laughs> we work in the government, do we write COBOL all day? Um, it's a fair question. Uh, people ask us that a lot. Um, I think a lot of government systems probably are running COBOL. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but no, uh, we actually use a modern web stack. Um, we have uh, an API that's written in Node. Uh, it's backed by MySQL. Um, and it's called the Submissions API, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, so the Submissions API ingests uh, clinician performance data and then returns information about how well that doctor is doing and how much they should get paid. Um, so that brings us to our topic today, uh, which is we needed an ORM for our API. So let's start from the very basics. What is an ORM? 
So ORM stands for Object Relational Mapping, and it maps application code objects to data in the database, and essentially extracts the database away. So a lot of people have very visceral reactions to ORMs. You can see Oliver here. This is back in 2008, so RM hate goes way back. Um, Craig, yes, thank you, Craig. <laughs> and Tony, finally. Yeah, I think a lot of us can relate. Um, so who here has had a frustrating experience with an ORM? Raise your hands. Yeah, a lot of people. Me too. Yeah, great. <laughs> uh, yeah, so we decided to DIY uh, because of that. Um, we decided to make one ourselves. Uh, so we made our own ORM. It's um, custom, bespoke, uh, small batch, artisanal, um, and it's ours. <laughs> uh, what could go wrong, right? When you build something like that yourself, what could go wrong? Nothing. Uh, so you might be wondering now, how did you do this? Uh, and we're going to walk through some of the main features of an ORM and explain exactly how we implemented it. Uh, so. Start with the kind of fundamental feature of an ORM uh, to find your data models. Uh, so in this case, we use SQLize, for example. SQLize is a very common ORM um, for Node. Uh, there are plenty of others, though. Um, so here we've defined a submission model, uh, which is sort of the, the central model to our submissions API. Um, so it's got two fields on it. Uh, this is pared down from what's like actually happening in our submissions API. Uh, but the model has a taxpayer identification number field, uh, which is a, a unique number for a medical practice. Uh, and then it created that timestamp. Um, so you can already see that there's like a couple clues there about um, how the database should store that data. So for example, um, on the taxpayer identification number field, um, it's, we say allow null false, and so that tells the database don't allow null in the column that stores this data. Uh, and here's how we define the model uh, in our code base. So uh, we make use of TCOM, which is a type checking library. Uh, it allows us to define models uh, with fields that have very specific data types. Um, and so we use this library to validate the incoming data and then based on the types of fields um, in the given TCO model, uh, we know how to serialize and deserialize that data uh, to go into the database and come back out. Uh, so in this case, we defined a custom field on our taxpayer identification number field uh, called encrypted string. And so that clues our ORM in later on how to actually serialize and, and deserialize the data. And we'll see that in a minute. So another fundamental feature of an ORM is data querying. And this is an example of how this would be invoked in SQLize. So you can see where you pass in a where clause uh, with the features you want from the database. And what you want this to spit out is all the submissions where that, uh, that clause is true. And this is how we did it ourselves. So you can see it looks pretty much identical. Uh, but we'll walk you through how that actually works in the back end. So the first thing that you'll need to do when implementing yourself is you'll need a persistence layer. And this is going to map your model to your database table. So you can see here um, our persistence layer allows you to specify the model type, in this case uh, submissions in this example, and it allows you to specify the table name. So this would be uh, the submissions table in our database. The second thing you'll need to define is deserialization and serialization methods, as Sam was mentioning. So this is how they're defined in our persistence layer. You have this get model to row function, which takes a model and then turns that into um, a database row. And you have the opposite, a get row to model function that takes row, turns it back into a model. Um, and you'll also need to define serializers and deserializers for all the different data types, all the different fields that Sam was mentioning before. So we have that encrypted string, if you remember, and we have special deserialization and serialization methods for that field so that when we call get row to model, um, we can take that field and turn it back into what the model expects and vice versa. The last thing you'll need to do is actually create the query. So um, you can see this is the find all function that we were mentioning before. And we're calling a variant on get model to row, which is turning the model into a database row with those fields. And we're using a simple query building library called connects to actually just execute that. Uh, so another main feature of an RM is the ability to <coughs> join table, ta uh, excuse me, join data between tables. Um, so in this case, we define two models. We've got a submission model, the same submission model we've 
uh, been referencing before, uh, and a measurement model. And so the measurements are basically the things on which doctors are being evaluated. Um, so then we define a relationship between these two models. Uh, we say that every measurement should belong to a submission. And so what that does is it adds a submission ID attribute onto every measurement instance uh, that holds the primary key value for its submission. So it therefore establishes the foreign key relationship. Uh, so then we can query measurements based on the attributes of the submissions that they belong to. So in this case, um, we're querying to see for we're querying to get all the measurements whose submissions has a taxpayer identification number of 00123456. Uh, and so here's what the analogous function looks like in our code base. Um, it, it basically just <coughs> um, calls a function with a where clause for the uh, measurements table, a where clause for the, the submissions table. Uh, it says this is a table that I want to do the join on, the submission persistence one, um, and then the field that you should, uh, you should join on. So here's kind of like how that function works. Um, you don't actually need to like absorb the code here. It's not that important. Um, but what it basically does is it takes those where clauses, um, it serializes them uh, with the respective persistence classes, uh, and then uses connects to write a join statement. Um, so writing this function by hand is uh, cumbersome for sure, but one really nice thing about it is that like we know exactly what is being run on our database. So we did this. We made an ORM, and we lived. We're here to tell the tale. Uh, and so we're going to walk you through a specific example of how our custom ORM helped us adapt to a very specific use case that came up. So remember this, this epic 800-page document. So our first interpretation of this indicated that every submission um, would have three kinds of measurements that a doctor would be evaluated on. So this is a submission, and you have three measurements, a Boolean, which is a true-false, a proportion, which is a numerator denominator, and a performance rate, which is like a funky mix. Uh, so these are the, the payloads that we're expecting for these kinds of uh, measurements. Um, there's a measure ID to indicate which kind of measurement it actually is, uh, and then the value field holds the, the details itself on the measurement. Um, so <clears throat> you can see it's sometimes it's Boolean, sometimes it's uh, an object, a nested field, uh, it could be anything. Um, and so in our case, we have these three different kinds of measurements. And uh, so what we did is we created three tables in our database that store these three types of data. Uh, and then here's, oops, that kind of cut off. Kind of yeah, Oof, rough. All right, well, um, here's basically um, how we sort of uh, translated those payloads into data in our database. You can see that in the case of the Boolean measurement, we just took the value field and mapped it directly to a column. So um, it's, it's a tiny int, it's going to be a one or a zero, which maps to, to true or false. Um, but with proportion measurements, we're able to do something a little bit different. We were able to take that value object and grab those fields inside of it, the numerator and denominator, and make them columns in the database as well. So we essentially broke that, that paradigm of like one field on your model to one column in your database, and instead just extracted those fields out and, and put them in their own columns. Um, and same thing with, with the performance rate measurements. So we extracted all those fields out of that value object and put them uh, into columns in our database. Um, and that's like a really custom thing that most ORMs won't do for you. Most ORMs like shouldn't do for you, uh, but we could, we could make our, our ORM do it. Because uh, <laughs> you wanted to. Want to. <laughs> but there's more. <laughs> this story doesn't end there. Uh, so this 800-page document again, well, it turns out that we didn't quite get everything right on the first pass. Um, or maybe these documents shouldn't really be a technical implementation guide, but regardless, we kind of had to go back to the drawing board. Uh, so what we discovered is that it wasn't just these three measurements. There's actually a fourth kind, a fifth kind, a sixth kind, a seventh kind. Uh, so suddenly we had all these different kinds of data that we had to accept. We're committed at this point to MySQL, normalizing the data, um, but because we had built this model inheritance class for our measurement model, fanning this out into more individual tables was relatively e easy. Um, and we needed to fetch all the measurements for a given submission. We were able to do those in parallel and really closely monitor the performance. Uh, so our solution is not perfect. Um, we recognize that. <laughs> you can tell us that. We won't be offended. Um, it's true, it's, it's not a perfect solution. Um, but the reality is, this is not a perfect implementation guide, right? Um, so when you have to build a, a highly scalable system, uh, when your requirements look like this, and 800 pages more, um, your solution might not be perfect, uh, but it just, it just has to work. Uh, 
Um, and work it did. Um, <laughs> it worked for us. Um, so I think it's, it's been a, a win for us because building our own ORM allowed us to like, quickly adapt to these exploding requirements that we were getting. Uh, and rather than have to put the complexity on the user who's using our API, um, we were able to handle that complexity on our end uh, and made a complex home rolled ORM. <laughs> And the caveat here is that you are redoing a lot of work. So you saw from the basic features that we outlined that we are mirroring a lot of what most ORMs offer. Um, we did have a small number of cases where we were doing complicated queries, and having the custom ORM in that case gave us full control over that case. But um, you know, if you have a lot of basic selects, basic joins, an off-the-shelf ORM might make more sense. Yeah, so I think ultimately, like, kind of what we realized is making ORMs is really hard. Um, that's why there are a lot of them, <laughs> and that's why people like to gripe about this problem. Because um, it's just a really hard problem. Like, it's, it's inherently a really tough thing to do. Um, and so, like, I think we, we went out to avoid customizing an existing ORM, and we succeeded in that, but we ended up doing, like, really janky things instead ourselves. Um, and we ended up being like really dependent upon our validation library, TCOM, uh, and so we kind of made a we made a trade off. Um, and so I think ultimately, no ORM solution is going to be perfect. Uh, it's just about finding the trade offs that that work right for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and kind of takeaway there is that abstracted tools are and can be super helpful. But in order to abstract, the tool has to make assumptions that don't always fit your particular use case. So if you have this specific thing that you really want to do, um, these tools can hurt more than they can help. Uh, so the key question, would we do it again? Um, <laughs> it's, a, it's a good question. Um, I think yes. I think the answer is yes, we would do it again. Um, I think it was, a, it was a good thing for us. It was at least like a neutral thing for us, <laughs> like net neutral. Um, <laughs> Like, maybe, maybe positive, but like at least neutral. Um, so I think in that case, it, yeah, it, it, it worked out. Um, but the key is to know your use case, right? Like, it, it really depends upon what you're doing, what kind of queries you're expecting to run. Um, because of the requirements on our system, uh, it worked, but the requirements for your system might be different. Um, and I think in a lot of cases, off-the-shelf ORMs do work really well. Um, they solve a lot of really common problems really well. So if you have questions, you can't ask them now, but please email us, <laughs> talk to us afterwards um, about ORMs, about civic tech. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you.